I think it's 3 p.m. We could start. Good morning. Uh, good morning. <laughs> good afternoon to all our viewers and a very warm welcome to this 17th episode of the EADI webinar series. I'm Doris Obrecht. I'm talking to you from uh, near Vienna in Austria. EADI, which is the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes, is running this webinar series since 2017. Our focus is on engaging with researchers and practitioners and hello, Steph, hello Stella, <laughs> and practitioners from all over the world who want to participate and who are thinking a little bit outside of the box when it comes to development issues. Today, we will not be focusing on the developing world outside of Europe, but on Romania. The title of today's webinar is this land is your land, this land is my land, and we will talk about land grabbing and land concentration in Europe, but especially in Romania. I would like to introduce you to our two speakers today. I hope Silvia is here. I can see Attila already. Hi. Then, Silvia, are you here? Okay. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Perfect. Perfect. Yes. I can hear you. Hi, Silvia. Yeah. Okay, so I can introduce you to our speakers. This is Silvia Kai. She's a political scientist from the Transnational Institute in in um, sorry, Netherlands. The sun is coming out here. It's rather rather nice, <laughs> but I can see you. Um, she's there conducting research on issues around land tenure, land grabbing, and natural resource government, governance and agricultural investment. And Attila Sosch is a young peasant farmer from Romania. He is the president of Eco Rurales, which is a peasant farmers association with about 12,000 members from all over Romania. He is also the land rights program manager of, of Eco Rurales. Silvia, Attila, welcome. Hi. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for taking part in this um, webinar. Before we will dive into the topic, I will give you some technical information on, on the structure for today's webinar. Um, first, uh, Attila and Silvia will have a presentation. This will take about 20 to 30 minutes. After that, I will have some questions and then we will have, we will have plenty of room for discussion and debate with you. Okay, so without any further delay, I'll give the floor to Silvia and Attila and ask them to give the presentation on land concentration and land grabbing. Thank you. Uh, hi, Doris. Uh, hi. hi, everyone. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, I just, uh, so I think I will share my, my screen, right? Because we prepared a, a PowerPoint and I'm just Perfect. going to talk uh, through that PowerPoint. Um, Attila and I consolidated our PowerPoints into one. So I will just try and share the screen with you. Great, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, well, thanks everyone. Uh, it's great uh, to be able to give this uh, webinar. Um, so how Attila and I have structured it is that I'm going to give a little bit of an uh, overview of um, TNI's work on not just land grabbing, but kind of broader uh, European land issues. And then uh, Attila is going to give a bit of a deeper dive into uh, the dynamics in Romania, because I think Romania is one of those countries that really sort of illustrates um, what is going on with, um, yeah, some of the dynamics that we're, that we're talking about. Um, so what I will do is give a sort of broader uh, introduction, a broader framing, uh, looking at some of the dynamics of how land is really debated in the European Union. What are some of the, the key sort of hot topic debates? What are sort of also the underlying drivers, the historical patterns that have really shaped land um, to be also a topic of discussion within Europe? Um, yeah, and perhaps just by way of introduction, just to say that um, TNI, for those of you that don't know us, uh, we're an international research and advocacy institute based in Amsterdam. Um, we do a lot of uh, research analysis um, on kind of key global issues. Um, and a lot of our research is uh, collaborative research with uh, social movements. Um, and we've been researching this uh, issue of land and land grabbing and land concentration and people's struggles uh, around that in Europe for about 
uh, 10 years. Um, and so some of the, the insights I will be sharing with you today will, are based on that kind of track record of 10 years of, of research on this issue. Um, yeah, and just to say that um, we wanted to focus this uh, webinar on the issue of land in Europe because um, if for those of you that are not so familiar with the land debate, the land question, um, this kind of really exploded onto the attention of the international media, of uh, academia and scholarship, of a series of NGO campaigning work um, and the work of um, social movements about uh, 12 years ago, sort of around 2007, 2008, there was this um, uh, global food price crisis um, where we saw the, the price of food and various agricultural commodities really skyrocketing. And along with many other kind of um, converging crises around the crash of the real estate bubble, the, the financial crash, um, the converging climate uh, issues, this really generated a huge amount of pressure on farmland worldwide. Um, and that sometimes became framed as this kind of global land grab um, issue. Um, but at the time, particularly sort of in that early phase, uh, 2008 to 2012, while there was a lot of attention focused on these large scale land deals um, taking place uh, in the global south in continents like uh, Africa and Asia and Latin America, very little attention was, was placed on Europe. Um, and so that's what we as, as TNI really wanted to kind of um, investigate a bit deeper. And um, this is what had led us then um, to the publication in, in 2013 of um, one of the, I think still one of the main compendiums really on um, the issue of land grabbing, land concentration in, in Europe. It was a piece of research that we did uh, with uh, the European Coordination Via Campesina, which is the European peasant movement, um, together with an NGO alliance called Hands Off the Land. Um, and what it was, was really trying to trigger a debate um, about land issues in Europe, um, putting it on the political agenda, putting it on the radar, um, showing that it's not exclusively an issue of the global south. Europe is involved both as an actor, but also very much as also um, a region that is affected by land grabbing and land issues. Um, and it was based on 13 uh, country case studies. So we did uh, some original field work together with um, our social movement partners. Um, and this was compiled into um, yeah, a book that really detailed the various dynamics across the pan-European uh, region. And yeah, if I'm to sort of summarize um, the key findings, the key uh, conclusions really from that uh, piece of uh, research, um, I would say we had about uh, six main findings. Um, so first one is that uh, really that Europe is experiencing tremendous and rapid uh, land concentration. Um, so this is... Uh, an issue which isn't always so well known, but if you really sort of dig a bit deep and you ask the question, you know, who owns land in Europe, who controls uh, farmland in Europe, you'll see that it's really, uh, it's quite astonishing the scale of concentration. Uh, we did some statistical analysis of the European Union's um, statistical database, uh, Eurostat, which collects um, some figures on, um, yeah, the number of farm holdings and their acreage um, and the amount of land that they farm. And we found that if you take that on aggregate, uh, each member state submits statistics. If you take that on aggregate, uh, just 3% of farms control over 50% of European Union farmland. Um, so that's an, a huge kind of imbalance that, that, um, that we see there. Um, I mean, in some countries, you know, um, it's more dramatic than others, but it's basically that trend of a very, very small amount of uh, farms controlling uh, a large amount of land that's mirrored across all member states. Um, in some most more extreme examples like Scotland, it, it literally is uh, something like 500 families control half of Scottish uh, land. The second, um, so that was a sort of generic, this generic back backdrop of a really undemocratic uh, state of, of the land in Europe. Um, but then we saw a second finding, which was 
which was to speak about also issues of land grabbing in Europe. Um, and I know that we can get into some definitional questions here and, and perhaps that's something for, for discussion uh, a bit later in, in terms of what we mean by land grabbing. But I mean, we documented various cases, um, for example, um, in Hungary, something called uh, pocket contracts. So these were um, kind of land deals where the official date was kept hidden because officially um, Hungary at that time was still uh, as part of its accession agreement um, and becoming a new member state of the European Union still had in place a sort of transition period where uh, foreign ownership, foreign direct investment in farmland was not yet allowed. Yet we saw, we found documented numerous, numerous cases of uh, investors circumventing those regulations by keeping the the date of the contract in their pocket, so to speak, only then to disclose them once this um, transitional moratorium um, was lifted. Uh, we also documented cases of um, kind of land auctions being manipulated in Poland. So um, when land became available on the land market, um, officially it was only um, uh, Polish farmers and, and priority would, was given to small farmers that would be have kind of first rights in this kind of bidding process for land but again we saw um, yeah certain arrangements being made whereby uh, those farmers that were eligible for the for the tendering process or for the auction process would then simply be used we called them kind of dummy or sort of fake buyers and they would then once they obtained the land would effectively transfer the control to a, a another um, often larger investor. Um, and then also, but Attila will talk more about this, we also documented uh, cases in Romania, re really instances of, of fraud and corruption, um, even cases where villagers were not even aware that their land had been transferred and officially sold off to another um, investor. So while it may be perhaps more limited in Europe compared to other regions, there are real cases of uh, yeah, land grabbing going on there. Uh, a third main finding that we had is um, also we wanted to raise this issue of um, green grabbing, which as an emerging phenomenon. Um, so green grabbing is really um, land grabbing often in the name of environmental protection or um, for so-called kind of renewable energy projects, which are often packaged in a very attractive way and are bolstered by also European Union um, policies and, and uh, directives that give incentives for these renew renewable energy projects. And um, well, in principle, of course, you know, the transition to renewables is to be uh, applauded. We've often seen that some of these renewable energy projects can be quite but very large scale can be uh, based on corporate monopolies um, and can also be highly contested in terms of their level of community uh, consultation. Um, so one of the cases we documented involved um, a contested photovoltaic uh, solar energy projects in, in Sardinia in Italy, which had really circumvented kind of some of the local zoning and planning uh, laws and uh, rules around uh, consulting with local communities. Um, and in fact, I even visited the village where this um, photovoltaic energy project takes place. And it's, you know, it's about, I would say, seven or eight times the size of the village, you know, and it's a really, these photovoltaic panels really surround the entire village. So it's quite, yeah, it is quite jarring when you see it uh, on the ground. Um, the fourth kind of key finding was that a lot of this is it's just being driven by, yeah, uh, change, changes around um, land use. Uh, a lot of commercial pressure is put on land. Uh, uh, there's a lot of competing claims on land. So we see that um, farmland is really being often sold off to make way for uh, more lucrative developments like real estate, infrastructure projects, you know, urban sprawl, um, supermarkets, leisure parks, you know, tourism, uh, enclaves, you know, things like that. And while it's totally um, understandable that there's competing interests, you know, uh, often there isn't sufficient uh, protection for those farmers that do wish to stay on the land and do wish to continue to run their farming enterprise to be able to guard against some of those 
particularly when it's more speculative elements um, in terms of uh, quick wheeling and dealing of, of land uh, uh, to, to make a profit. Um, I mean, in, in France, it was calculated that um, in the case study that we documented there, that something like 60,000 hectares of land are lost each year to this kind of changing land use from agricultural to non-agricultural use. Um, and that's been an issue there for some of the, the farmers that, that we work with. Um, yeah, this is all being backed up by certain institutional rules and market forces. Um, I perhaps won't go into too many details here, but just to say that um, the EU does operate, you know, certain viability thresholds for who is even considered to be an active farmer, which often excludes the, the, the smallest um, producers. Um, we've seen a huge amount of, uh, because of this huge amount of pressure put on farmland, we've seen farmland prices rise um, exponentially over the past um, 10 years or so. I mean, we're talking about increases of 100 to 230 uh, percent increase in the price of, in the average price of uh, one hectare of farmland um, over, let's say, a nine or 10 year period. Um, and this creates a huge amount of, puts a huge amount of pressure on farmers, you know, can lead to situations of debt. Um, and yeah, puts a lot of strain on already quite um, unpredictable and precarious uh, circumstances that they find themselves in. Um, but yeah, against these trends, we also documented, um, or we, we pointed towards, you know, a, a sort of count, counter trends and alternatives. Um, I'll, I'm going to go into those more towards the end of my presentation. So I'll just um, go on to the next slide before, uh, before I return to what some of those alternatives uh, look like. So um, that study, I think did, I think stir up a little bit of a debate, which we were, um, we were happy with. And um, it led to a, a specific follow-up, which was that we were asked by the European Parliament in 2015 to uh, write an official study for them on uh, the extent of farmland grabbing um, in the EU. Um, this was a, based quite um, a bit on our previous study, but went much more into depth into the analysis, a kind of interrogation of the underlying drivers. Um, we looked more at some shifts and historical patterns over time. And it was more policy focused. So we also had a really set of policy recommendations there, which I will come to also in a bit. Um, yeah, and we presented this in, in front of the, the COM Agri, which is the Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development uh, at the European Parliament um, in 2015. And if I were to sort of summarize again what some of the key findings that we had there, um, a lot of them mirrored our previous study, but what we did is we, we wanted to ground a bit this uh, concept of land grabbing much more strongly um, in the European context. What is, how can one speak of land grabbing within the EU? Understanding that it will always be a contested term. It will always be a term that has, you know, for some it has very legal content, connotations, for others, others it has more social justice connotations and it's more about um, the substantive issues, not only the kind of technical, legal, procedural issues. So that, you know, that will always be part of the debate. But um, in our study, when we talked about kind of a land grabbing phenomenon in Europe, we identified kind of four key indicators of that. I mean, one is we talked about land grabbing when it comes to land deals that are really out of standard European proportions. Um, so the average farm size in the European Union is something like um, 14 and a half hectares. At least that was the case a few years ago. I think it's a little, a few hectares more now. Um, but anyway, small scale still. Yet we saw some of these land deals, you know, were going into the uh, sometimes thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of hectares. So there was a large scale, both in terms of the... Um, actual size of the land holding and also the scale in terms of the, the scale of the capital often behind it. Um, they, would, they would land deals that represent a deep rupture with the European model of family farming. Um, so Europe has always kind of prided itself on having, having this kind of family farm model. Um, but we saw with uh, these kind of new land deals that were emerging that um, not only were they, they uh, much larger in size, but they also have a new way of organizing 
uh, social relations, organizing markets. Um, they were much more making, seeing farming as part of an investment portfolio, for instance, working with subsidiary companies, you know, so that the beneficial owner is often even disguised or not disclosed. Um, it's a much more entrepreneurial and corporatized um, way of farming um, that really kind of feeds into the EU's narrative as well of kind of um, export driven and, and, and competitiveness in, in agriculture. Um, thirdly, they involved a new set of actors and investors. So, um, you know, which didn't traditionally come from the agricultural sector. We saw uh, a sort of broader trend, I would say, of financialization of agriculture, where we saw things like banks, um, hedge funds, pension funds, insurance groups, even some individual traders kind of get involved in, in this kind of race to, to buy up um, farmland. And, and they very much constituted a new asset class, um, which was previously not active so much in farming um, and in farmland in Europe. And um, lastly, they also implied, um, these land deals implied a sort of uh, what we called an extra economic force what do I mean by this? I mean here that, that they often didn't operate through standard market dynamics. It wasn't just about the kind of buying and selling of farmland through, yeah, um, through the land market. They often involved also things like certain special connections, um, either to economic elites or, or political elites. Um, the role of mayors was often quite uh, significant in some of these land deals. Um, and there was a whole kind of coterie of additional actors around the investor, um, what we also termed things like land deal brokers that kind of mediated um, the purchase of farmland and kind of extended systems of power, uh, patronage and privilege when it came to um, these deals taking place in the first instance. Um, so yeah, that was a whole other uh, characteristic and an identifying uh, factor in these deals. So that was that was a bit how how we approached um, land grabbing in Europe. I, I know others will have perhaps some different opinions, different interpretations, but that's how we anchored a bit uh, and justified also the use of that term in our study. But we very much argued that, you know, we can't only just focus on these large scale land deals. You know, that's often perhaps some of the most uh, um, visible or perhaps most exciting quote unquote thing to talk about, but you really have to understand these kind of large scale land deals taking place within a much broader historical pattern and a much broader context um, that have created a kind of state of fragility, a state of vulnerability, um, which has allowed then farmland to be taken over um, and to be to submit to, to some of these pressures. Um, and what I just wanted to show you um, here in my screen, I don't know if you can see this with the video, um, was, uh, yeah, just the, really the decline of small farms in Europe um, over time. So um, again, this is based on European Union statistical information. We, you know, we saw, we tracked the kind of patterns from 1990 to 2013. And you'll see that without exception, um, in all member states, you know, there's been quite a real dramatic decline in uh, the number of small farms um, in the country. So when I say small farms, I'm talking about the smallest farm category that the European Union collects um, statistics on. So agricultural holdings uh, below 10 hectares. Um, and you'll see, you know, drops of, of ranging between sort of 40 to to. Uh, Eighty percent uh, in various countries. Uh, how to how to go to the next slide? Yeah, um, another th thing I wanted to then, um, but another one of the main uh, trends, kind of underpinning that was, uh, and very much working kind of hand in hand with these overall uh, trends is. Um, really the bias and imbalance in uh, support that is offered to different categories of farmers. So um, just, yeah, one of the things that we also looked at was this um, imbalance in the distribution of CAP direct payments. So 
Uh, for those of you that don't know, CAP is the EU's common agricultural policy. It's the main subsidy and development, rural development uh, support system uh, for farmers in the European Union. Um, but the way that the CAP is based is it's based on a per hectare payment. So um, it's yeah based basically not only but but uh, uh, in, in large part on the amount of uh, hectares under farm management. Um, and because of that, you'll see that the system is very much skewed towards um, a small number of beneficiaries. Um, so you'll see, you know, figures like this table that I'm showing you here, which shows, you know, cases of, for example, Bulgaria, that first one, just 1% 1 of farmers um, that receive CAP uh, subsidies in the country uh, have been allocated 45% uh, of the total payments that are directed to Bulgarian farmers. Um, and again, uh, the degrees differ between countries, but you'll see the same trend over and over again. Then I just want to come to um, the set of policy recommendations um, that we um, put forth uh, based on our analysis and um, which we also then presented to the European Parliament. These are not, uh, this is not to say that this is uh, a panacea or these are all our recommendations. I'm just uh, highlighting a few that, that we listed. Um, one was really to, to kind of, I mean, uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant. So we thought, you know, there's a lot of um, non-transparency still in the land markets in, in Europe. I mean, member states do report on, um, yeah, to the number of farm holdings and, and uh, a whole array of other kind of farm statistical data and surveyed work does take place. Um, but we, what we propose is kind of this creation of what we called um, a European land observatory, which wouldn't just, uh, would perhaps have a, one could say a more activist character in the sense that it wouldn't just um, collect data for the sake of data collection. It would also function a bit of as an early warning system. So when trends like the trend that I previously described about farmland prices really increasing dramatically over the past 10 years, um, if, if what those kind of trends are identified, that, that there's a kind of uh, raising of the flag, let's say that this is a kind of trend that's taking place um, and that this would be um, then also uh, a call to action. So um, yeah, that was, and it would also be a way to kind of consolidate uh, some of the findings that are a bit scattered and fragmented across different uh, EU um, offices, different different kind of uh, research departments, you know, would, would kind of uh, function really as a kind of in-house um, monitoring uh, and early warning system. The second would be uh, to allow member states um, more leverage in terms of regulating their land markets. Um, so uh, there are different models for this and countries do different things. Um, but you can think of ways in which uh, uh, you can uh, regulate the land markets to uh, offer some protections against um, the more negative uh, aspects of uh, foreign direct investment or some of these large-scale land deals. Um, you can think of things like preemption rights, which kind of give um, first right of um, access to land when it becomes available to particular types of farmers, say young farmers, say small farmers, say agroecological farmers. Um, yeah, you can, you can tie also land ownership to certain land use objectives, uh, more sustainable forms of agriculture, for example. Uh, yeah, different countries have different models. Like I say, there's, there's a model that's often raised in these kind of debates. Um, it's imperfect, but it is um, something to, to point out, which is in France, where they have um, uh, certain land administration bodies in different regions, and every land transaction that takes place within their jurisdiction, um, they have to be notified of, um, and these land administration bodies can then um, intervene in, in case that they suspect kind of speculation in terms of the price, if the price is much higher than the average, for example, um, they, can, they have the right to actually block sales. And they have the right to also set certain criteria when it comes to um, how land is allocated and, and to whom. Um, 
I saw, yeah. Um, then, um, yeah, we, we recommended using the most progressive schemes available under the Common Agricultural Policy. Um, this is a little bit different now because the, the CAP is undergoing uh, reform. So some of these debates are, are uh, being uh, still, uh, are a bit sort of, uh, uh, have passed us by. But what we, what we kind of, our main point there was to say that, that there's a lot of schemes within the CAP which are actually quite, can be quite positive. Things like a small farmer scheme, a young farmer scheme, a redistributive scheme, which is the kind of top up payments for the first 10 hectares or so. Um, but those schemes are, uh, a lot of them are discretionary and, and not obligatory. And so many member states hadn't really made use of them. Um, and so we really, really recommended making use of some of those schemes. And then last, we really argued for a much more, um, a different approach really actually when it comes down to it fundamentally to farmland in Europe which was much more um, holistic and human rights based. Uh, we recommended it really being based on implementation of um, international best practice using kind of legal instruments like um, the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure of land, fisheries and forests, which were an international, internationally agreed set of um, guidelines around land and which had um, also the involvement of um, social movements and uh, civil society were active in their negotiation. So that was one um, kind of international reference point that we recommended uh, Europe also uh, look at. I'm going to go to my last slide. Yes, so this is my last slide. I apologize if I've been a bit overrunning. Yes, uh, I just wanted to, um, so what I wanted to do here was just um, outline or flag for further discussion, perhaps some key um, debates as I see them, uh, kind of around uh, land in Europe. They, yeah, perhaps um, without going into too much depth, but I do just want to briefly just um, take you on a little tour of this uh, spider diagram that I made. Um, I mean, if we start with the top uh, right-hand corner, the purple line, one of the one of the, so one of the key debates is is um, to what extent is um, is the European Union land market based on what's called this uh, free movement of capital. Uh, which is uh, actually one of the founding principles of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. This idea that we have this internal market within the EU where investment and capital can, can flow, flow freely um, from different countries uh, versus the uh, regulatory capacity of states to put restrictions to that free movement of capital. So that's been a real ongoing debate actually um, over the past few years in the European Union. Um, uh, the European Commission has actually uh, launched what it's called infringement procedures against certain member states. So infringement procedures meaning actual legal challenges um, to the authority of some member states to introduce restrictions to their land market. And yeah, that's, that's been a sort of uh, a still unresolved um, uh, elements in the debate uh, and it's made more complicated by the fact that um, we now have in addition to outright purchase of land you know um, a lot of land is transact transacted through um, share deals so um, companies buying up shares and other agricultural companies and thereby gaining control over land so that whole debate is, is, is also made much more complicated by that level of financialization. Um, the second key debate moving now to the bottom right hand corner would be about um, the fact that that uh, uh, against, uh, so this is some of the alternatives that I was mentioning uh, previously, um, against this trend of, of corporatization and large scale land deals and financialization, uh, we also actually see new forms of land stewardship, um, land management emerging that are much more like aimed at taking land out of the markets uh, are based on things like uh, land trusts, which um, make land available with, with uh, a certain um, social mission or, or um, have a particular, uh, uh, yeah, purpose to, to, to the land that they allocate. 
Uh, we've also seen much more citizen involvement in, in, in some uh, land purchases based on things, innovative things like crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, things like also a community right to buy, uh, which was part of the Scottish land reform process, whereby communities could actually register a community of interest and um, have the right to purchase land uh, uh, and put it in under community control. So that's really a kind of counter current. And there are many more different um, uh, examples like that. Um, then on the bottom left, uh, another key debate which is really popping up now is um, and gaining traction is the movement for uh, agroecology throughout Europe. And uh, as TNI, we're also involved together with uh, Ecuralis and a number of others in a, in a European uh, partnership looking at uh, promoting access to land for agroecological farming, uh, which is really a, a way of farming which combines, um, yeah, uh, elements of uh, insights from agronomy and ecology. Um, and yeah, these are debates around um, what, what does, uh, in, in order to promote agroecology as the solution as well to the crime, climate crisis and the need to kind of decarbonize our, our society, um, what role does uh, the food system really play in that? You know, this is linking up into debates in Europe around the Green New, Green New Deal, just transition, et cetera. Um, and then the final points I just want to leave you on is um, in terms of this whole land debate and where it's heading, um, how we as TNI really try and practice or, or maneuver ourselves in that debate is to really try and articulate what we call a land politics from uh, below and a land politics from above. So really looking at how can we um, uh, engage in the energy that uh, is present in things like the Nieleni Europe food sovereignty movement. Um, how can we mobilize that to also put pressure um, and push for change at legislative change at EU level, um, even working on things like a sort of new land policy for Europe or a new EU land directive, um, as it's sometimes called. Um, yeah, but I, I think I will, will stop here um, and we can perhaps return to some of these debates in the question and answer session. Okay, thank you very much, Silvia. And now, Attila, please give us your, um, your view on the situation of Romania, especially. All right, can you hear me well? Is it okay with the sound? I can hear you. Maybe All right. Others can uh, state in the chat if they can hear you. Per, um, yeah, by just it's not, not too silent because sometimes my laptop tends to have not the amplification. No, All right. No, no silence. Okay, so uh, Sylvia will be switching the slides, I think, continuously, and I will con continue. So my name is uh, Attila Search. I uh, work at Eco Ruralis, which is a Romanian national peasant organization. Uh, peasants are, generically speaking, small farmers in, in Europe. We are uh, uh, peasants that practice agroecology and uh, that we promote food sovereignty. Uh, and we are part of the European coordination Via Campesina, uh, which is the European peasant movement, uh, part of La Via Campesina, the global peasant movement. And uh, I work a lot on land since, uh, well, a little more than 10 years. So I'm studying the, the Romanian land market and uh, the patterns of land stewardship and land control in Romania. And that's, that's something um, I, I, we, we at Ecoruralis had to do because uh, we as Ecoruralis, as, as peasant farmers, uh, have put the question since 10 years now, who are our new neighbors? because Romania is an agricultural country and it's an agrarian country. And uh, we as peasants are, were defining the, this, this, this country to food production, to the food chains and so on. But now we have new neighbors and the land patterns and land stewardship and land control is changing in Romania. So if we go just a little bit of history of control of farmland in Romania, and why do we talk about uh, Romania in this webinar, for instance, and why not talk about another country? We could very well choose as a, as a pattern of investigation another country from Eastern Europe. What we have in common with other Eastern European countries is our communist past, is our socialist past. And it's a very important because before 89, um, it was a long history of forced collectivization of farmland. So basically, privately owned farms uh, and farmland was being forced into 
state control and then and, and, well, party politics play and everything was controlled by the central, let's say, party and government. And this is very important from our side because that's where we lost hope in cooperation. That's where we lost hope in, in working together. Uh, that is a trauma that we still bear that comes out and comes around when we start to renegotiate our connection, polit political connection with land and what we want in this part of the, of the, of the continent. So basically, I don't want to dwell a lot on the communist past. Uh, almost everything was collectivized. Basically, in the communist regime, Regime, there were two kinds of farms, the state farms uh, and, the, and the cooperative farms, so-called collective farms. And after the, the communism fell, uh, post-communist governments created a set of uh, land redistribution reforms. Uh, they were hardly agrarian reforms, they were just land redistribution reforms, which gave back basically the land uh, to the, their original private owners. This, uh, this meant that the state farms have been kept in state hand and state control, but the collective farms were broken up into equal pieces uh, based on historical facts of, of ownership. So um, uh, what we see that by the end of the, of the land redistribution reforms, uh, by the early 2000s, statistically, in Romania, it has, uh, the agricultural system has developed. On one hand, we have the privately owned uh, uh, land, and on the other hand, we have the large concentrated farms. On the uh, small farms, which are approximately 4 million landowners with an average of 2 hectares, and then on the other hand, we have the state domains agency that is still hoarding the, the, the state land, uh, which is around 1 million hectares of agricultural land, but uh, uh, really also concessioning out a lot of the land to, well, the, the, the highest bidders, let's say. So an interesting fact of the early 2000s is that the idea of commons was not completely dead from the point of view that uh, uh, in animal breeding, it's uh, simply it's not rentable. When, when you have like 10 cows and you want to herd it on two hectares, it's not really possible. So uh, animal breeders maintained somehow their, um, let's say common control over land and uh, all local authorities have maintained a part of this decision making over this land and land stewardship but still it was an interesting new idea of the commons was emerging and i will come to that importance later uh, now presently what we are in the situation as uh, sylvia has very much been exposing we have been doing a lot of work in uncovering who is what are the land patterns and land control uh, and land ownership patterns in Romania. And uh, we see that it's continuously being reshaped by the control and pouring of capital inside, uh, inside land, the land market of Romania by especially large agroindustrial holdings, but most importantly, non-farming speculative investment funds, banks, and all kinds of local and multinational oligarchy, uh, which is grabbing large amounts of land. And unfortunately, this is also and has been also historically backed up by the governmental agenda, which is very much revolving around land consolidation because everything uh, what we've been hearing is that we need to grow bigger, we need to be bigger, we need to consolidate land, we need to have ever bigger farms so that we can produce ever more grains. Romania is a huge grain producing country. So it's completely disregarding the, this, this uh, history of peasantry uh, as an agrarian history. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, Silvia, please. Um, so basically, statistically, um, still, based on all the changes, 99% uh, 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 of peasant farmers, they control more than half of the, of the agricultural land of Romania, which is around 14 million hectares of agricultural land. Uh, on the other side of the story, uh, not even 1% of the companies that are registered control the, almost the other half. So almost 7 million hectares of agricultural land. While we see that an average size of a peasant farm in Romania is 2 hectares, and this is also thanks to the equally redistributed land after the communist era, uh, the average size of industrial farm in Romania is 200 hectares, which might not sound a lot, but the top 10 largest agri-industrial holdings in Romania hold together uh, almost like actually more than a quarter of million of uh, hectares of land. And this is 
data from 2015 and the concentration is higher now. So now the problem is that uh, uh, according to the last agricultural census, Romania is not, and then Silvia was showing also this, that the number of the farms, especially the small farms are dropping. Uh, in three years in Romania it dropped 6%, which is huge when you look at how many people are engaged into farming, uh, which statistically amounts that in Romania every hour, three family farms disappear. That means that uh, in, uh, in three years, 76,000 peasant farms disappeared and the trend is accelerating and now it's being observed as a problem on the European level as with the disappearance of like farmers and concentration of farmland. So conclusion is that if you can go to the next slide, please, Silvia, is that um, basically as the graph shows, uh, we have a huge concentration of land in Romania. Uh, but we still have uh, land stewardship uh, in a lot in the hands of large amount of peasantry, uh, peasantry which is getting ever older. The average age of a small peasant farmer is 65. So we are facing a lot of problems when it comes to farm succession and where these lands will end up after the their owners will be not will not be able to farm them and we see on the other side of the story that uh, 28,000 companies uh, actually own uh, almost 7 million hectares of agricultural land uh, we can go on with the slide um, so basically this created a set of obstacles uh, when it comes to accessing farmland in Romania to practice peasant agroecology. And why is it important that we practice peasant agroecology? Well, agroecology, I, I, it's not maybe the, so much the scope of our discussion, but it's a guiding principle uh, and another kind of food system that we propose, which is really addressing the current uh, food crisis and climate crisis. The peasants have been practicing agroecology historically and have been very close to natural farming or regenerative farming and landscape, uh, landscape uh, stewardship and, and farmland stewardship. Uh, but uh, right now, these peasants, which in Romania, they are called Tsaran, which Tsaran means people of the land. So basically the, this intrinsic connection with the land. They, we are facing a lot of uh, problems and, and on the policy level, since Romania has joined, the, especially since Romania has joined the European Union, of course, we have entered into this um, principle of EU free circulation of capital. But this is a two side story, like uh, we can invest in other countries and other countries can invest in Romania from the EU. But because of the disproportionality in wealth and, and in capital accumulation, we ended up um, with a lot of uh, multinational capital being invested into Romanian farmland. And that really accelerated the, the well, the, the unbalanced the power between local communities and their right to farm and to produce food and the large multinational investors, which have several, uh, let's say, inclinations to do farming, either from speculation, either farming from the international markets, either because also multinational investors come from countries where land is saturated. So they are trying to find new opportunities for land. So there are various reasons of why we have guest farmers, as we call them in Romania. So um, we also have another policy problem that we have a very permissive national legislation. And this is not just because the European Union, Romania is historically very permissive when it comes to opening up the land market. It is not a problem of foreign versus, uh, versus national. This is not a nationalistic problem. It's a problem of, of rights and opportunities, which are not equal, which should be equal. So the right and opportunity to access land and the right to land, uh, because of the, the, this permissive legislation, is not equal between peasant local farmers, for instance, and large investors. And uh, although we do have uh, now a law after the fall of the moratorium of the seven years that we entered the EU, uh, we have in 2014 we have um, we have ended the ban on farmland sales. We have not, as a country, renegotiate our our ban on farmland sale, but created a preemptive rights based law, which basically gives power to local communities if they have the money <laughs> to benefit from this power. Problem is that Romania suffers from a huge underdevelopment very largely also because of the massive investments into land that concentrated a lot of land and a lot of land means a lot of big farms and a lot of big farms means there's not no need for people so the romanian villages have been depleting migration is very high 
and uh, um, we have a we have a big problem of uh, rural poverty. So if there's a rural poverty, even if land is available, we don't have money to buy that land to to use our preemptive rights. So obviously we need more safe, uh, policy safeguards in order to, to, to access land. Now, another problem that Silvia already highlighted, I will not insist on it, is the area-based cap subsidies. This was a huge problem. Romania stumbled in the European Union at a time when the cap subsidies are, were defined on an area-based system, largely. Um, now this is changing, but we already are in the EU in several years and in Romania indeed a lot of the the subsidies these subsidies went to well as Silvia showed one percent of the big farmers or the ones that hold the land which not always farm now um, on the economic and cultural side we have some obstacles that one obst obstacle is that uh, I was talking about this trauma of communism so this led to a very individualistic approach when it comes to land ownership and land control and it's very hard to create local cooperatives family cooperatives so that we can participate better on the land market and this is something that we need to we are working as an organization to to let's say uh, not fix but promote and try to use this opportunity to co cooperate but the, uh, it's it's also very hard because um, that same isolation that helped historically communities to cope cope with the communistic era, that means that really communities were self-sufficient and, try, and tried to live as much as a decentralized way possible from the central regime. Now it's taking us into this isolative thinking that uh, uh, we have very large limits when it comes to welcoming new entrants in farming. Might those also be new entrants that respect the culturality and the, the the farming patterns of the area um, and this is what we call it's very hard to set up in Romania extra family farm succession and this could come very handy uh, in this case now that we have a lot of aging farmers and very low intra family farm succession so if we go on to the next slide basically um, we were talking about definitions a little bit. So Echo Ruralis was working a lot on land grabbing. And uh, uh, in order to work on land grabbing, we had to define what we call land grabbing. Uh, we were uh, working a lot with other definitions, but that at the moment in 2016, we realized as, as a peasant movement in Europe, that we need to have our own definition of, of land grabbing so that we can uh, show what we talk about when we say that where well, there are these large in land investors coming in Romania and buying land or in Germany or whatever. And uh, so basically for us, uh, land grabbing is about the control. It doesn't matter through what kind of control as to ownership, through lease, to concession, through general power administration of larger than locally typical amounts of land. Yeah, I come from an area where the typical amount uh, uh, of farmland per farm is around Two hectares indeed so if we have an investor that comes and buys here or or controls here let's say 100 or 200 hectares which is the actual example which we suffer from in my area it means that the disproportion is already very high we are not saying that uh, we need to be uh, let's say uh, analytically equal which that we say that we need to respect each other's patterns of working and uh, this is something that we observe through our research that where a large investor comes in and and uh, there's a tipping point of how much that large investor grabs the rural uh, uh, development starts to fail and people start to migrate and lose interest into living or farming in that area and it's not uh, uh, um, uh, it's not uh, um, coincidental that in Romania the poorest areas of Romania like this Gini coefficient that we are talking about if we overlay it with the large land concentration map of Romania the, those points which are largely concentrated are also the poorest in Romania so there's a correlation between land concentration and development of, of rural poverty now um, we mean by land grabbing also if the land grabbing happens via legal or illegal 
means because legal can not always be just and illegal is always illegal so um, which are for the purposes of speculation over land or extraction purposes we have large mining companies uh, that want to set up uh, in Romania and, and extract gold or extract other other uh, minerals and uh, this is creating a huge social injustice or for the, the sake of resource control and commodification of land uh, at the expense of peasant farmers, agroecology, land stewardship, and food sovereignty. So this is basically our definition of land grabbing, and according to us, that we, we guide ourselves and we call you're a land grabber or not. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, basically, uh, it, it, there's a question of like, who grabs land in Romania? Well, large multinational banks like Rabobank from the Netherlands, we have been doing a very interesting uh, uh, research also together with TNI and other allies uh, mapping out who are these large land grabbers for instance like Rabobank uh, or Generali which is an insurance company uh, we have a saying uh, you name it we have it because we have also insurance companies we have banks we have oligarchy we have hedge funds uh, large Romanian capital that are somehow grabbing land. International traders like Cargill are contract farming and do, doing a lot of control of land in Romania. And if we talk about how much land, it's a big debate in Romania, the government doesn't recognize one millimeter of land grab, but uh, according to our civil society research, almost 4 million hectares of land are already grabbed based on our definition, but this is increasing every year um, because uh, now, again, there's a huge wave of, of this kind of like commodity uh, financialization of land all over Europe. And um, also near agricultural lands, we have hundreds of thousands of hectares of forests that are being grabbed, which are also our livelihood. We have a lot of, let's say, gatherer societies in Romania that still live from the forest and also thousands of hectares of uh, uh, large industrial mining projects are being developed. So it's another uh, aspect of land grabbing. Now we have been doing some study and if you move to the next slide Sylvia, uh, we have been doing some studies around this so uh, besides participating also in the study that uh, uh, Sylvia was mentioning we have created a fact-finding mission reports because we have doing we are doing a lot of territorial work and we have been doing case studies you can all find uh, find it on our website which is changing so don't don't be uh, uh, freaked out if you cannot go on the Ecolars website right now, uh, but it, 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 it will be there. Uh, we have been doing a lot of case studies and one could ask why do we peasant organization do this kind of work is because in Romania, unfortunately, nobody is doing it. And we have a constituency that are farmers that are demanding this kind of information. And we demand it from the government and we don't find any answers. So we demand it from, from media and we have a very good collaboration with investigative media to map and find some of these deals. But we need to do our own uh, solidarity movement and mapping and transparentization of the land market. So that's why we are doing this. If we go to the next slide, um, we also map this out. This is an internal map that I wanted to share. Um, that we are starting to map out because we need to see where these deals are going. So uh, we wanted to, to create our own mapping system uh, to show it. And we share this with, uh, with allies and investigative journalists and when it's needed and we update it constantly when we can. Uh, we can go on also. Um, and um, this is as, as, our last, as my last slide. Uh, so basically, okay, we are fighting a lot the negative, but what, what are we proposing? What is our vision? What are our demands? So our demands are not astronomic. Our demand is to create the transparent and account accountable public institutions. We have a lot of corruption. Basically, from one indicator where we know that there is land grabbing going on is, for instance, with Rabobank. It was so many land deals per that case that if you are not exercising corruption, you cannot do accomplish that kind of concentration of land in Romania because literally they had to take land from thousands of, of, of owners of land, small farmers. And indeed we found out that many of them didn't even know that their land were taken away or sold off. Um, so we need a lot of transparency and this links to the claim on a European level of the land observatory that Sylvia was mentioning. And we need to amend our law, which is a, 
public debate right now in the parliament to amend our land law and to base our land law on, on human rights based instruments that are already coined out and are already accepted and voted in, like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Peasants, which has just been endorsed last year, and um, uh, another tool, a technical tool that we can very much use and very useful, the United Nations uh, Tenure Guidelines. Uh, that really define land tenure from a human rights based point of view, not just from capital accumulation and market based uh, point of view. So we need to harmonize EU laws. This is why uh, we see the big blurriness and we see that countries around us like Hungary, like Poland, because of different, let's say, fails or not of amending policy, land policies in their countries are suffering from infringement. Um, this also comes not just because of the populistic measure that these countries took is because the confusion of the EU laws uh, uh, around the land debate. So we need to harmonize the land debate and we need the EU land directive uh, which is coming from this human rights perspective. So this is another claim that we are we are seeking and of course we cannot have uh, uh, the market sorts it all direction. In Romania, we see how where this with this took. So we need an active state when it comes to intervening on the national land market. This is why we like preemption rights, and we 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 salute, for instance, the measures when the state wants to intervene on the on the land market in Romania and uh, have a, a holder holding of the land and redistribution based on criteria like. Should it go to young farmers? Should it go to more agroecological projects? So we see a future in this. And of course, we want to be part of the debate and under the consultation. As peasants, we have a, a grassroots and on-farm and on-field vision over land. And this needs to be taken in consideration when it comes to coining out new policies. So I'm going to stop here uh, because uh, I think it would be valuable if we use a little time we have to maybe have a small debate. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Attila, for your for your presentation. Um, as we can see, there are a lot of interesting issues and a lot of important issues you brought up in your in your presentations. As we are, let's say, nearly out of time, I will give the floor immediately to our audience. If there are some questions, you can ask them via microphone. You just have to switch it on on the left um, bottom corner of your of your screen or you can just tip it in the uh, type it in the chat room so are there any questions from you maybe someone is is writing or so but i have a question um the the president of romania made an issue in his election campaign last year he got re-elected that to stop uh, corruption and also the government has changed um, from social democratic to let's say center right. Do you see some, Attila, do you see a, an opportunity or is it just bringing up more obstacles, these changes in, in the government? Hmm. Yeah, um, indeed the land debate is a lot on the political um, uh, debate also because while indeed the the let's say the social democratic government which i will not call in romania the ex government uh, leftist government but but uh, they were very populistic and they were promising a lot of changes in the land law from a populistic point of view but indeed uh, uh, that government uh, suffered from a lot of corruption and that meant that a lot of these these uh, these uh, aspects were were not properly taken in consideration now with the re-election of the president in Romania president has only foreign derogatives like it is really intervening it cannot really intervene by constitution in the matters of the state uh, just by approving laws but uh, otherwise uh, it really um, I would say just a populistic <laughs> outcry of indeed we have a lot of corruption the corruption uh, uh, is one problem and indeed in agricultural lands the corruption like buying it is, is a huge problem for that we have an agency the anti-corruption agency and and that's something that they are taking up also that we see on the anti-corruption agency's website and communication that also they are researching and and uh, looking into agricultural companies that are, are doing this now the problem is that um, and this leads a little bit to this population uh, debate of the Romanian saying that oh, only Romanians should buy land. Uh, it, the, 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 let's say the little truth in it is that what we see from our investigation is that 
the the problem is when speculative companies buy land, they buy it from offshore companies, they buy it from very hidden companies that are very hard to, to create transparency. So they are very hard to prosecute. And there are a lot of human rights problems when, when they pour in a lot of capital, let's say from safe havens like Cyprus or Barbados or um, other, other kind of like fiscal paradises. And then they just set up little companies and those buy land or bribe off local officials to, to, to uh, intermediate land uh, control. Uh, and how do you prosecute them? So corruption from this side is also a problem, but indeed um, uh, it's a very big debate on how to how to resolve it. We see a little bit of uh, right now. Uh, we see a little bit of uh, let's say a positiveness is that the new government uh, is. Uh, has to deal with the, the cap discussions. So it means that right now they, we have as Romania to define our national strategic plan, which has a lot to do with subsidies and a lot to do with the distribution of, 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 the, of the next cap. So we were invited along with other organizations inside this debate. So it's a little bit, uh, let's say, horizontalizing this debate. And uh, also our proposals on land, for instance, the active intervenience of the state in the preemption right process or giving land to young farmers farmers. These are something that were picked up by the new government and at least on a declarative way they want to promote it. So it's a little bit of a, a, a better but this is not an elected government. So we are waiting for elections to see what, what we do. Okay and there is a question. Has Romania have a land register system? Indeed Romania has a land registry system. The, Rom the Rom Romanian land registry system is between two systems. One of the let's say more from the the north of Romania is, is much more accounted because of historical papers and uh, facts. The Ottoman Empire, which was morally ruling the south of Romania, is not uh, was not really keeping this kind of records. So so there the records have been lost. So but it does have a modern land registry, which is now being digitalized also very heavily, and a lot of EU money is going into that. But the problem is. Uh, also this land registry, and we have an internal debate of in Eco Ruralis, whether we support the cadastration of the lands, the official cadastration of the lands, or we also like much more rely on uh, what we say, um, uh, this kind of intrinsic la land rights, this kind of uh, um, land rights that are not the official registration. Because many times we see, for instance, in Rabobank, because the lands were not officially registered in the cadastry that they overtook, they were the first registration registrators of those lands. And that meant that in front of the court, they were showing, well, this land is legally just ours. It belongs to nobody because there was no official record of it. And that is, that is a big problem because a lot of people were suffering because of those unjust deals. So it's very hard to, to prove this. So we are in between back and forth on a land registration system. Of course, in, in a modern European country, cadastration and land registration offers you security. But then we need to really look into how these uh, systems are also transparentized. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Okay, we have a statement from Anna from Greece. The same happened here in Greece, but it actually resulted in land grabbing for the people with no papers for exactly. their land. Exactly, like the same in Romania and in Eastern Europe, it's a reoccurring pattern. Uh, also, unfortunately being said that land cadastration work started when our countries were not part of the EU yet. Uh, all kinds of practices were promoted and where FAO and others were promoting uh, practices sometimes with, uh, let's say, uh, uh, yeah, foul money and so on, sometimes didn't really go into the best systems uh, of how to develop them. So we see now also this with our work in other countries, post-Soviet countries like Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, same kind of issues that we have. Okay. If I could just uh, come in there. Sure. Yeah, just because um, I don't know if I have my video still on, by the way. Um, it is on. It is on. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't see myself, so I wasn't sure. Um, just, just to follow up on that, because I think it's a really critical point that's being raised. Because um, so often, what I hear, like when when you when people ask, you know, what is the solution to land grabbing? How do we stop it? How do we fix it? You know, um, so often, quite often, you'll hear the response that, oh, the solution to land grabbing is to have. Um, secure and legal land titles, you know, and um, often, quite often that's conceived as individual land titles, although 
that's actually changing. There is a more recognition now of other forms of um, land ownership and management, which are based on uh, communal or customary forms of uh, land tenure uh, systems. But what I want to stress here, but, and, and the experience of Romania and, and perhaps also Greece um, shows it, is that it's not enough to simply, you know, think that by setting up a, a cadaster, by uh, extending uh, land titles, by having a kind of legal document, that that's um, a solution in and of itself. And actually, um, you know, especially when you take on board like historical patterns around discrimination and marginalization in rural areas, um, those that often have like the easiest access and um, yeah, have more more uh, a more convenient way of uh, securing their claims to land. You know, those are not necessarily um, the people that that you know could perhaps most benefit from having uh, protected land use. So we often see that it's it's you know um, slightly more the better resource, the middle class farmer that will more easily get uh, secure access to land. Meanwhile, those that um, yeah are in a more precarious position will, will not get so um, and even you know there's a, there's a huge amount of incentive just to get a land title in order simply then just to sell it off again because they don't see any kind of prospects um, in terms of making a kind of viable livelihood out of it so yeah I just want to stress this fact that it's a lot more complicated than simply you know thinking uh, we need to give everyone land titles and that and thereby the kind of problem is solved there's a lot it's a whole complex array of uneven agrarian landscapes you know over, over a period of time um, class differences and and um, yeah that's also why the this international um, document that we were referring to these international guidelines on land tenure they make also a distinction between legal land titles and what they call legit legitimate land use so to say that you know it's not only those um land users land owners that are protected by law that that's um that we have to take into account it's also looking at okay based on long periods of land use and based on community consultation who also has a legitimate right to that land um, and i think that's also a useful distinction to bring into the debate Yes, thank you very much, um, Sylvia. Are there any other questions from our audience? You have now the last chance. I think we have to, to end then. Okay, then I'll say thank you to you, Sylvia and Attila, for this very interesting presentation and, uh, and your speeches, um, for taking your time to talk about your research and your activism. Also, thanks to anyone who joined us here, to our audience. I hope we will see you again. You will have the next opportunity uh, within the next webinar, which will be at the end of February. It is planned for end of February. The topic will be the role of rights and accountability in the making and shaping of social protection. I hope we will read and see each other again. Thank you and have a nice rest of your day. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Thank Good you. Bye, bye everyone. Bye bye. Goodbye.